the, what has been the biggest change you have made in training that has improved your pondering at times? Because you've improved quite quite a lot actually in the past year. So have you, have I actually? Yeah, but yeah, okay, so we've both improved <laughs> over the 400 <laughs> over the past year. Today we're doing a Q&A. We've never done this before. This is the first time we're doing this on our YouTube channel. So welcome, welcome. Um, we are doing this because we have had a lot of new subscribers to this YouTube channel. At filming of this, we reached 15,000 subscribers. So thank you to everyone who has supported this channel. And we realized that there's so many people from around the world and we assume people know who we are, but to assume is to make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> so we are doing this for you guys to get to know us a little bit better. So we've pulled some questions from Instagram stories, but also from the comment section in a lot of our YouTube videos. And we are going to do this almost like a podcast format where we ask each other questions and just have an organic chat. We have microphones as well. Yeah. And we do think we can do a podcast one day. So let us know in the comments below what you think about this Q&A. Should we get started? Yes. Okay, so to avoid confusion, let us introduce ourselves and what we do. So you go. Okay, so I'm Lavia. That's how it's pronounced. A lot of people are confused about that. So I'm Lavia and I'm the 400 meter runner. I'm Lena and I'm the 400 meter hurdler. And together <laughs> we are the Nielsen Hurt. <laughs> and we also do the 4x, so I was going to say, we also do the 4x4 four four together. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> well, we have done, but hopefully more in the future. So I'm going to start with a fun question because this is uh, from my Instagram. Why has Lavia never tried hurdles? I think I've never tried hurdles because I'm, I that's not, not something that I was interested in and not something that I naturally went into because Lena was always really good at some of the rhythm stuff that we do as, as athletes. And so I think yours was a natural progression, but there's not one part of me that wants to do it. So I'm trying to get her to do one at the end of the season. That leads to the next question, which is what drew Lena to the 400 meter hurdles? So like Lavi said, I loved doing the rhythm stuff. And then one day I just did it for fun. Like I just hurdled over this random hurdle on the track. And I said to my coach, I think I want to try it out. And all my training partners were like, yeah, go on then, go on then. <laughs> just enter one. And so I did it. Uh, I think it was my last year as a junior. And uh, it wasn't too bad, actually. So I always knew I wanted to do it. It just took me about two or three years to finally get the courage to, to switch. And here I am. There we go. And so we, when we put this Q&A on Instagram, we had like over 200 questions. <laughs> so what we've done is we've categorized them into categories and we'll put the chapters um, in this YouTube channel so you know what to look for. We thought it'd be good to answer questions of two types. I've got a cramp in my <laughs> I was trying, trying so hard to not make it seem obvious. Oh, have, you, have you hydrated today? We've decided to split these questions up into two types of questions. The first is questions about us, so getting to know us. And then the second is questions for you, which is basically tips and advice and uh, yeah, things that you can take away. And then we also have some quick fun ones in between all of those as well. So we've had a lot of questions about where it all began. So let's take it back to the beginning the one question that we wanted to answer is when and why did we start track and field it's a classic story and many of you might have heard it already but we grew up in London um, in a borough called Waltham Forest which was actually one of the Olympic boroughs so when the 2012 Olympics came to London we were 16 years old and there were so many opportunities for us to enter sports competitions but the main thing was we got to volunteer at the 2012 Olympics as kit carriers and that was really what kickstarted it we wanted a taste of what that was like Larvi carriage for Jessica Ennis Hill <laughs> and we just saw these athletes and thought these are normal people who just worked really hard to get to where, where they are now. So we were, we kind of decided amongst us, why can't we do this? And then I think like soon after that, we found our first athletics club. And then the year after that, we found our first coach who took us to professional level and took us to our first GB bests. So when we first started track and field, we actually were doing distance running, so 800 and 1500 meter runs. Um, and we weren't very good. So when people ask us, were we good when we were younger? We always say no, like we were, B below average at best like we were not <laughs> winning anything I think you had actually won the London Youth Games in the 300 yeah. and even then we didn't think oh actually we should do a 300 and a 400 <laughs> we still went back to the 800 and 1500 in cross country and it was only when we were 17 18 did we decide to step down to the 400 and that's when we realized that the training just worked so much better for us and the 400 just progressed yeah. really nicely from them so we actually got a few questions about like did we plan to become professional athletes or did we know so someone said did you always know you wanted to be professional athletes and the answer is no no we didn't we wanted to just do track and field because we 
enjoyed it. But then also seeing the Olympics, we didn't put two and two together that going to Olympics for you. You might be professional. Some people aren't, but yeah, we didn't set out to be professional athletes. And that leads on to the next question, which is what advice would you give to someone who wants to make athletics a career? We would say don't put too much pressure on yourself um, because the bottom line is you should enjoy it um, yeah. and striving out for it to be a career. You might strip away that enjoyment and that fun. And the more fun you have, the more you want to train and the, the more you train, the, the harder you want to train. Yeah. And then eventually it kind of snowballs into becoming professional. Yeah, yeah, they say athletics is like the poor man's sport. Like if I compare it to something like tennis, if this question was, how would you become a professional tennis? We'd have to say, go find a tennis club, find a professional tennis coach, pay for that tennis coach. There's a lot more steps when it comes to other sports. In athletics, it's black and white. If you're fast, you're good and you're going to be professional. That's why we say don't put too much pressure on and don't try and seek things because if you just focus on naturally progressing and just enjoying it at the same time, chances are you're going to progress into becoming a professional athlete because it can happen to literally anyone. Okay, so that moves on to the next question is why do we both represent different clubs? Because we said we found an athletics club, but we're different clubs now. <laughs> the main reason for you to have an athletics club is so that you can compete at the British Championships and also in this series of competitions called the National Athletics League. Now, when I was a, when switching to the hurdles, um, I wanted to race some of the best hurdlers in the country. Unfortunately, Enfield and Haringey, which is Lavi's club, was in division three in the country. So I wouldn't have any of the best four hurdlers to race against. And Shaftesbury, Brown and Harriers, which is my club now, were in the premier division. So I switched to race some of the best hurdlers in the country in the National Athletics League. But when I did switch <laughs> and train a bit harder, I, be I became really good at the four hurdles and so I could get competitions abroad. So I never actually competed at National Athletic League. So I switched clubs for basically no reason. And that's the only reason we have different clubs is just so I could race at the National Athletic League yeah, in exactly. a higher division. A lot of parents were asking us like, oh, it would have been so difficult for your parents to take you to one club and then the other one to another club. No, we were the same club for a long time. And we were also the same sponsor for a long time because that's the next question is why do we have different sponsors? So again, you need to ask yeah. that question. So similar to the last question about clubs, it was just because of better opportunities. I was with Adidas for six years and loved it. And when it eventually came to the end of my contract and the start of a new one, they, I just compared two different avenues and um, Puma seemed like a good option to go down. So I eventually left and I've now been with Puma for four years. So the, both those questions to answer is just because of better opportunities and that's... That's it. I don't have anything against any, <laughs> any of the previous ones. Um, I just wanted to be a, a better athlete, basically. Cool. Yeah. So moving on to uh, a bit more specific questions. We've got a lot of questions about the 400 meters. So we're going to try and answer them to the best of our ability. So I'm going to ask Lavi because she runs the 400 meters and she'll be able to give you guys good tips. What are your tips for running the 400 meters? Okay, so my tips for running the 400 meters is I've, I've run 400 meters in a bunch of different ways and there's a hard way to run it and there's an efficient way to run it. So for many years, I was actually running it the hard way, mm. which is basically like, get into full sprint and then hoping that I can just maintain and hold on. But now, especially over the past few years where I've run like 50 point consistently, um, I would say the best way to run a 400 is you need to get going in the first 60 meters. So I, I would say like get to your top speed and run it to 60 meters and whatever you have at 60 meters, you hold that for pretty much the whole way. And we can get into like more specific stuff about when you reach the top bend, you want to slowly wind up. But if you can just... I always say the 400 is a rhythmic, fast run. Even though it's classified as a sprints event, mm -hmm. it's a rhythmic, fast run. So you have to be within your rhythm, within your flow, run fast, but not flat out. And then when you get to the last 100, just pump those arms. So I'm going to take notes on that because I need to be able to run a good 400. <laughs> I always ask my sister, how, how do I run 400 meters? Because it, it was one bit to me and that's one of the reasons I switched to the four hurdles. Yeah. But another question we got was speed or fitness for a 400 meter runner? Some say that a lot's that lots of people need more speed work. That is a, that's a very specific question. I think that question has probably come from people who are already like within the sport or within the event. You'd, you'll find that a lot of people say there's speed-based 400 meter runners and there's endurance-based 400 meter runners. But let's look at someone like Femke Boll, like world record holder over the indoor 400. She has, she's naturally like very fit. And over the past few years, her coach has basically said to her, you need to put more speed into your training. And so the both of those have worked for her. There's no one, I can't sit here and go, well, you need more speed work or you need more fitness work. You need to find what's right for you. Like we always say in the 400, if you're strong at something, there's 
definitely going to be a weakness that you have that you need to try and focus on. Yeah. So for us, for many years, we, similar to Femke, came from an endurance. I'm not saying that we're like Femke Ball. <laughs> we, like we want to be like her. <laughs> we want to be like her. Similar to Femke, we came from an endurance background. And that's why, like, when we were training for the 800, it just didn't work for us because we were trying to train endurance, 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 and it just didn't work out. We actually ran a faster 800 training yeah. for the 400 because we were putting in speed work. Yeah. So yeah. speed work works for us. And that kind of leads on to the next question, actually. What has been the biggest change you have made in training that has improved your pondering at times? Because you've improved quite quite a lot actually in the past year so have you have i actually yeah but yeah okay so we've both improved <laughs> over the 400 <laughs> over the past year so similar to what larvi said about do we need more speed work and what taylor's what what's tailored to you the, i think the biggest change we've made this year yeah correct me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. is more recovery yes 100%. more recovery and this is the, something and actually there's another question here and tips for training for the 400 i train very hard and my time doesn't show yes so we have actually put in more recovery in our training schedule. We only trained five days a week yeah, compared we have, to six yeah. days a week last year. We have two whole rest days. Two whole rest days. And our, one thing our coach is really good at is if we're doing training, let's say, for example, we have six reps that day. If we do four or five quality good reps, he will say, don't do the last one yeah. because you've done enough. And it took us a while to wrap our heads around that mentality because we've always come from a work hard, work hard, train hard, do as much as you can yeah. to actually you've done enough don't overkill, don't overtrain. Yeah. And that's actually one of the biggest changes we've made this year. And I think it's yeah. why we've both seen PBs over the indoor 400 and then hopefully over the outdoor 400 and the 400 meter hurdles. Yeah. <laughs> because even last year, like we started working with Tony in July. A lot, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. So you, we, all, we started blogging Road to Paris in October. Yeah. So we'd been working with Tony for like a month at that point, but oh, it seemed like we had been working with Tony for a month at that point, but we started working with him in July. Mm -hmm. And I ran a PB in August and ran 50 point twice or three times in August yeah. and September. And it was because we had trained, he stripped our training back. He looked at our training program and said, you guys have done way too much. <laughs> and he stripped it back. And I remember standing on the start line and thinking, have I done enough? <laughs> I'm actually like, I don't know if I've done enough. I trained enough. Yeah, but we, like, it, it was the easiest 400 meters, meters I ran that season. Yeah. So easiest. if you're someone who thinks that you're training very hard for the 400 and your times aren't showing, chances are you need to strip back training and just focus on quality good reps. And don't be afraid to recover. If yeah. you're tired, just rest. So, now we're going to go into, over to some fun questions before we go back to a few more tips for you. Your favourite memory from your career so far? For me, and I think for a lot of athletes, they'll say their PB run. Uh, I, ride, I raced against um, Femke. I say race against Femke <laughs> in, in the loose term. <laughs> in the same race as Femke Ball. She was about 20 metres ahead. Um, <laughs> it's saying her name a lot. We are big fans of Femke. She's, she's also the nicest she's person. She's so nice. She's just so lovely. Um, it would be my PB race. I raced uh, in Rome, which is where the Europeans are later this year. So I'm really excited to go back there. But race in Rome and I was in lane nine. How many times uh, have you run in lane nine? I don't know many lane nine. How many in the world have a lane nine? <laughs> nine, what's that? I was put in lane nine. It was, it was so weird because I felt like I was in the crowd. Um, yeah. And I ran, I just raced like a woman possessed. And uh, yeah, I came fourth in the Diamond League race and, and got a PB. So that was actually my favorite memory of, the, of my career just because I, because I was out in lane nine, I just said, just run. And I forgot anything else and I just ran. And it proved to a PB, so that's one of my favorite memories. And what would you say your favorite memory is? Yeah, similar to that, my, my PB race, but my first 50.83, because I've run 50.83 twice. <laughs> so the first one, which was back in 2019, was in the London Stadium. I'm pointing at the window because we live in East London and I can point around where it is. <laughs> um, it was a home crowd. I think there were like 40,000 people in the stadium. And when they introduced my name, it just erupted and I thought I have to pull out something here today and I was running and the whole way I literally felt like the crowd was pushing me along and I think my PB up until that point was 51.5 and I've dropped down to 50.8 which was wow. I think the home crowd had a big part to play in that I didn't run 50.8 for another four years after that so it just goes to show how much I pulled out of my pants <laughs> to run that um but that was just home crowd is just so special and I think Glasgow as well was probably yeah so best. speaking of home crowds Glasgow World Indoors. How nervous were you both for the World Indoor Championships? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was, shall I, get, shall I start with my individual yeah, and then you talk good. about the relay? Yeah, you okay, start. We'll split it that way. So the individual, um, I was really nervous. I was nervous for the whole week because it was my first time competing individually in front of a home crowd. I did London 2017 relay, Glasgow 2019 relay. So this is my first individual in front of a home crowd. And people had been floating around the idea of me getting a medal. 
not just like people on Twitter and Instagram, but also my coach and other members of my team and also myself. Like I think once you go into a final, like anything can happen and I've never won a medal before. And I thought if I'm gonna do it, it's gonna be in Glasgow. So I was really nervous for the heat and then the heats felt really good. That was like the easiest 51-8 I've ever run. And then I messed up the semi-final, <laughs> which we remember from episode seven, I think it was. And so I was really, really nervous for the final because I didn't realize how much can go wrong in an indoor 400. Um, and then, yeah, I just ran my heart out and I was like, thank God it's over. <laughs> Fun fact about that, that was the fastest race in history. Did you know oh, that? Oh, really? That was the fastest uh, indoor 400 meter run race in history. Like the fast, obviously, Femke run a world record. We're gonna count how many times <laughs> we mentioned <laughs> Femke. <laughs> um, but it was the fastest second place, third place, and fourth place in history. So you're looking at the fastest fourth placer in history. <laughs> but then I was also, again, really nervous for the relay because I was running with Lena and I knew we could win a medal and I didn't want to lose one yeah. in, in Glasgow. Um, I was nervous for the heats of the relay because um, I was first leg and they, the team had said to me, we want you to go through 10-3-9. <laughs> and that season I'd only gone through in 24-0. So I was quite nervous. I was like, am I going to be able to do this? I actually ended up going through in 23-7 and it was the easiest 23-7 yeah, I've ever done. It looked like she was chilling. I was watching sat <laughs> on the side like, is this her legs not moving? <laughs> but um, unfortunately the Polish had had another goal. So they got in front of me. Um, so that was quite frustrating. And then I was really calm for the final, actually. We had done a British record in the heats. And I felt the track, I knew what it was like, and I was ready to fight. Like it was a switch. I was nervous for the heats and then for the finals, I was like, I'm ready to, to fight yeah. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that that kind of leads on to, we're gonna talk about nerves and pre-race anxiety, but just to, before we get there, I think the point of that is I was nervous for the heats because I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. And for the final, I knew exactly what was happening. Yeah. And it took away the fear of the unknown. So I was, I was very yeah. calm for that. that. Those were my nerves for the final. I didn't know what was going to happen, yeah. especially being in lane two. This is a really funny question. I have to say, <laughs> I have to read it out. Someone said, I've been doing competitive running for a few years now, but in capital letters, will the nervousness ever decrease? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> I'm going to say no. I'm going to be brutally honest and say no, they won't. But you will get better at handling them. Mm -hmm. That's the best way. I think often, and I, I think we can answer this from both perspectives because bear in mind, we have been fans of the sport for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we've been on the other side of it as in watching it on telly and we've been there in the stadium competing ourselves. And I will say, we, you, when you're watching it on telly, television for our non-Brits, <laughs> you always think oh my god they don't look nervous they look so calm. I wish I could be as calm as yeah. her she looks so composed yeah and I can guarantee you every athlete that you thought has felt like that has been nervous yeah like everyone's experiencing yeah. nerves and and I think you can take comfort in that is knowing everyone's in the same boat yep and it's just how you deal with it yeah I guess so yeah and like we said before let's just touch back on what we said earlier about fear of the unknown those were those are where nerves come from mm -hmm. most the fear of the unknown like i was so much more nervous for indoor races than outdoor races because outdoor races you have your own lane you kind of know what your race plan should feel like and so i felt calmer in, in outdoor 400 meters even if it's been like a lot at stake yeah whereas indoor you're like who's going to come in who's going to take out this first 200 what if we all get into traffic and one of us falls over like you're thinking of all the things that could go wrong yeah so the best way to then battle that is how do you deal with nerves before competing and pre-race anxiety yeah there's a few tips that we can give for that yeah so going into the fear of the unknown the one thing that i tried to do let me know if you feel the same way <laughs> is I always make sure I run through my race plan now indoors is completely different indoor yep. running so we'll put that to one side but outdoors we are in our own lanes um for the 400 meters and 400 meter hurdles so I always think about what my first hurdle will look like how will I get to the first hurdle and I don't think about any of the other hurdles obviously I have a race plan in my head but when I'm stood behind my blocks I think about the first hurdle because yeah. As one of my previous coaches used to say, the most important hurdle is the next one. Yep. So I always just think about the first hurdle and then when that happens, I can think about the next one. But of course you have your race plan in your head of the whole race, but thinking about the whole race is very overwhelming. So if you can just break it down and think about what you will do when the gun goes, it can kind of alleviate those those race nerves because you, you just focus on, on getting out. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> You let, I let you know I feel the same way um, <laughs> visualization that's a huge one uh, you should know what your race should look like like from an outside perspective and you should know what it feels like the most nervous I've been is if I've gone into a race thinking I'm so unprepared I'm not ready I this that the other 
or it's races that I'm not confident with the race plan. So yeah, t if you have a coach, talk to them about your race strategy and have it dialed in because you don't want to go into a race thinking, what should I do? Like, what, yeah. what do I do now? Like that's, that's when you're going to be nervous. Yeah. One of the tips my sports psych also gave me is list your strengths um, in your head. So list your strengths. So I always tell myself I'm fast, I'm strong, I'm ready. I'm ready in the, in the fact that I've done the training, but also... Yeah, we are, we're all strong. If you step out on the start line, that is strength. Yeah. To step on the start line against seven other people, that's strength. Yeah, showing and, up. Yeah, showing up. And and yeah, fast because I like to think I'm fast. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to move on to another common question that we got asked, which is about disappointments and giving up and motivation and things like that. So do you ever think about giving up? There is not one track athlete in the world, actually, you might find one. There are not many track athletes in the world that will tell you they've never thought about giving up like it is very common so if you are thinking about giving up you are not alone yeah <laughs> we thought about giving up when we were doing 800 we were yeah. like it was clearly not for us <laughs> we're not good at this <laughs> it took us to find another event to think oh actually we should carry on yeah um but the, yeah there's loads of ups and downs like you'll hear athletes talk about highs and lows and yeah. the lows the highs are great and they're amazing. When they happen there, it's incredible. But when the lows happen, they are so low and you're just thinking, why do I do this? Like I've put so much effort into this, time, money, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and you're just thinking, I'm not getting anything back from this. So like, why should I carry on? Yeah, but you'll often find, and I think one of my favorite quotes is from JK Rowling and she said, rock bottom is the foundation on which you build your life. And uh, story time, <laughs> um, I narrowly missed out on the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. I was... There were, there were three spots to qualify for. There were four girls fighting for the spots and I was the fourth girl. So I missed out on the Olympic Games. And that was just, that was the definition of tragedy for me. <laughs> I did give up. I told myself I'm retiring. I've got a great career in yoga. Like everything's going great then. And I did, I told myself I was retired. That was it. Like I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, I didn't train for four months. Mm. Four months I didn't train for. And then I said, you know what? It, I was so close to the Olympics and the next one's only three years away usually it's four years but we had pandemic the next one was three years away and I, I told myself right what is it that you did wrong and how can you how can you train to make sure that never happens again so sometimes the the lows is what drives you and then going into 2022 I had one of the best seasons of my life yeah and that was because I that I used the disappointment. I said, I never want to feel that again. And um, I trained so well that year, mentally and physically, but mainly mentally, really applied myself. And that's actually still my PB from that year. It was 54-7. Yeah. It wouldn't be broken this year. <laughs> but yeah. sometimes look at the times of giving up is you're very, very close to the goal that you want to achieve. And so looking at, at, at that thought of giving up, sometimes means you just have to keep going just a little bit longer yeah almost you're almost there it's like that I think there's that meme where there's a guy like picking away in a, at a rock and he's like so close to the diamonds and he walks away and you can see the diamonds are, like right there yeah it's this picture here because I forgot <laughs> that we can do this <laughs> so being close to giving up is being very very close to the goal I think sometimes yeah I think a lot of athletes will will resonate with that yeah, for sure. Yeah. So how do you stay motivated when you're struggling to see progress in training and races? Oh, I think we can both answer this because we've gone years without PBs. Like, what's the longest you've gone without a PB? This is, well, in the four hurdles, this is like my, my second year. The 400. <laughs> so it's six years. <laughs> yeah, we but actually, we both broke seven year PBs, PBs this, this year indoors. Yeah. Um, and I waited four years between 50.83 the first time and then 50.8 the second time, four years. And so like you're training, you're training hard, like you're putting all the work in, all the recovery and the nutrition and everything like that. And you're not seeing progress. I think the best way to stay motivated is, I don't think, I think motivation's a myth. Yeah, I think motivation's yeah. a myth. Like I've never gone into a season thinking, I need to find new motivation if I'm gonna break my PB this year. It's always been like, okay, like what can I change? Like, is there anything that I can improve on? And like, for example, last year or this year when we both run PBs, it was recovery. We yeah. were like, we know we train hard. Like we know that. So what else can we do? And it was like, okay, we need to focus on something else. Yeah. So recovery, nutrition, like we've really been on top of all of that this year. Yeah. Um. So in those moments of like stagnation or you're plateaued, look at anything that you can change, anything that you can improve, Um. even as simple as maybe taking, I don't know, taking a break. So you're mentally coming out of it because sometimes you're so focused on this one goal you can reach mental burnout and mental breakout, breakout, yeah. burnout. Um, so like doing something like that, just take your mind off the things can really help. Yeah, I think everything you said is an example of 
uh, discipline shows up when motivation doesn't. Yeah. So if you want to see progress, really break down everything that you're doing and see where you can make those small improvements and then you might see progress and that might motivate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's now a category of questions and I've categorized them as <laughs> what would you do? What would LL do? So I'm going to ask you first, if you couldn't have become athletes, what would you have liked to do? I was actually talking to someone about this today. I, we, I'll, I'll say I, but I think you, you're the same. I really love education and we love learning. And I loved my degree at university. I studied geography at university, which is so different to sport. Um, and I was really interested in like climate change and like development. I reckon if I wasn't good at athletics, I would have continued going down that route when I was at uni. I probably would have been like in a grad job or, <laughs> or, or something like that. I probably would have been like one of those people in their late 20s who picks up marathons. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been that person by now. Yeah. But running has always been like a part of us. And so I think I would have maybe had like another job but still running yeah in fitness yeah still watching athletics yeah I probably would do the same as Lavia I, I studied uh, chemistry at university as a, a means to get into medicine because I didn't do A-level maths <laughs> I had to do another science but I probably would have gone into either um, medicine or getting a PhD it would have been nice to be a Dr Nielsen we're nerds <laughs> we're down <laughs> um, if you couldn't do the 400 slash 400 hurdles what event would you do <laughs> I know your answer and you know mine they're both jumping events I would have done we would have been twins who do the same thing but slightly different I would have done high jump and Lena would have done any long jump long jump anyone that knows you knows would have done long jump I would in another life I would be a long jumper well it's not too late because um, in my event I take off anyway so I might like, do a long jump before my career ends and I'll ask Jazz for some <laughs> tips. <on that. laughs> and the last what would you do question is what sport would you do if you weren't doing athletics? I would have liked maybe to have learned tennis. Tennis. Tennis, yeah. yeah. That's the only other sport I think we watch when it's on. <laughs> Just wear those nice skirts. So then the next thing, we're going to bring it back to us. So we've answered some questions for you. So now we're going to ask some more questions about us. And this general category is about sacrifices as an athlete. <laughs> so what do you think the biggest sacrifice is being a top athlete? I think we actually just spoke about them like other career paths because oh, yeah. it is really hard to be a you know, full-time athlete and work. And I commend anyone that's doing that. I did it for a while and it was very, very hard. Um, so I think we've sacrificed or if, even put on hold our yeah. careers because obviously we'll go back to to yeah. those careers. Athletics doesn't last forever. Yeah. yeah, I've also put my yoga career, my yoga teacher career on hold yeah. this year going into Olympics. Um, so those that sacrifice is really hard and also not seeing your friends. <laughs> That's all one I was going to say. Yeah. I, I was going to say friendships, but not in the sense that like we've had to give up friends, but rather what you do in those friendships. So like we're not present all the time physically yeah, or even <laughs> emotionally because what we do is just such a big um stress on our lives and our, we, we're lucky to have incredible friends who completely understand it but like sometimes I think we miss out on birthdays um I don't know if we've missed out on weddings but we've missed out on like certain events that they've been holding mm. and we haven't been able to show up and sometimes you see it on Instagram and then you're, you're somewhere else and you're training and or you're at home because you need to recover and I think that's that's a difficult one as well that's a sacrifice although I don't really like to use the word sacrifice yeah their choices their choices we, we choose to do this and, and how another sacrifice is sacrificing our life in London because we train abroad a lot of the time since 2020 one we've trained yeah. abroad um so how did you find the courage to move overseas for training That's yeah question I think at that point we were in a bit of a plateau in our careers like um I think at that point I hadn't run a PB in two years and I don't know what it was for you the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Olympics yeah yeah missed out on the Olympics and so now we're looking at like yeah changes what could we do how could we be better how can we make sure that when the next olympics comes around we're in the best possible place we did look around coaching options in the uk and we couldn't find anything that suited us um and so the next thing to do for us was to look overseas which we're not the only athletes that do that a lot of our british athletes actually do train overseas um so it was just a natural step that I think we had to take as professional athletes. Yeah, and I think the the drive to be better athletes overpowered the fear of moving abroad. And it is scary at first, it's a massive change, any change is scary, but um, it worked out for the best. And so, yeah, and we have fun with it. We always try to find our favorite coffee shops, our favorite restaurants, favorite mm. parks when we're abroad. So we try to, we try to make it feel like home. Our dog comes with us. And our dog, Logan, comes with us. <laughs> He's there. <Always> <laughs> <sweet>. <laughs> <laughs>